Hi, Rishi.
get going. Uh, Dr. Ajami, how are you? Good, how are you? Very good. Uh, thanks for making the time today. Of course. And uh, let's get this started. Uh, we'll have a few more folks. We got quite a few RSTPs and uh, you should see them joining us. So let's get uh, the conversation started. And uh, so this is a uh, Reality Check with Rishi. It's uh, Sunday afternoon and we have been talking about community challenges in this particular series and uh, what we'll focus upon is a conversation around water. And, uh, you know, I think Silicon Valley has been dealing with this problem for, for a couple of decades now. And uh, what has happened in the last couple of decades is a population spike. You know, we have grown in population that started really during the dot-com boom and a housing development uh, that essentially grew in every city, projects that happen in every single city. Case in example, when you look at uh, a city like Cupertino, Cupertino has gone from like 17,000 to a population of about 65,000. And with the Valcomal project, uh, there is probably likely a lot more development that is going to happen. And then when you look at a city like Saratoga, we have held our population constant. We were uh, tied with Cupertino many, many years back and we, we climbed up in population and we sort of has been a minimal service city. You know, we did not rely upon uh, commercial sales tax dollars and we were very careful in terms of uh, the development part projects that were rolled out and plus we have fairly big lots that we are now built out. It becomes harder for development projects to happen here. So we have stabilized at around 30,000. I believe we are at 30,000 30, for a couple uh, decades now. But then when you look at uh, Santa Clara, Sunnyvale, or Palo Alto, Mountain View, I mean, they are seeing high rises. You know, when, I, when you look at uh, how Silicon Valley is morphing, if you go back to the dot-com boom, which is when I arrived here to Silicon Valley, you know, we used to typically have like uh, two-story structures. And now when I drive to different parts of uh, the area, you know, what I see is uh, <clears throat> we are building out like four or five-story buildings and uh, those are very prominent at uh, different intersections. You know, if you drive on, let's say, San Thomas or Saratoga Avenue, you have, or, or perhaps on Page Mill, you will find a lot, lot of these high-rise uh, buildings that are sort of coming up. And in fact, uh, they have a very different architecture compared to what we were used to seeing, but that's a different story altogether. So, you know, we see a population spike. And in fact, uh, you know, there is a huge push to build more and more office space. And uh, there is a talk that we, we have about five jobs to every single housing unit that we're launching every year. And uh, so that's, that's a big problem. So there has been a push for housing uh, with, on the basis of bills like SB 35, uh, Senate Bill 35, which sort of deregulates uh, or rather preempts uh, local control over housing. And we are, uh, we are looking at different state laws to provide that avenue to build uh, more and more housing in Silicon Valley, which is leading to a lot of issues with traffic and the infrastructure, and that brings us squarely to water. So, so that is a context, a little context to in terms of what's going on. So if you look at, uh, you know, when I first moved to Silicon Valley, you know, my take was, you know, it's, uh, we, we need to rely upon water and having big lots that we do, we said, you know, why don't we look at exploring, putting a, a well here that can provide us the water. And very quickly we found that there are regulations that prevent us from doing that and for the right reasons, because you know, if you go back a couple of decades ago, or probably in the 70s, I think, or 70s or 80s, with the subsidence, you know, we, our ground was sinking because the groundwater was depleting. And we had, uh, we had sunk essentially about an 18 inches. That creates a lot of issues with bridges and things like that that have been built, and we have to prevent that from happening. And so there were policies that were rolled out, and uh, good policies, I believe, you know. And, uh, but at the same time, what I see lacking is uh, the ability for us to craft out a vision with respect to uh, water, the infrastructure that we need for water. And uh, there have been some uh, different, uh, you know, essentially uh, initiatives where we talked about building out new reservoirs, but uh, they, have been, they, haven't moved, they haven't moved forward for a variety of different reasons. And then when we look at the Anderson Reservoir, you know, that's been basically declared as unsafe now 
and the water has to be drained out. So there was a time where in the drought, maybe in 2016, the Anderson Reservoir was at 10% of the of the uh, of capacity. You know, it was at 10%, and perhaps uh, we should have done something then. But we are obviously not ready. Valley Water District is a, a very well-run organization. It's the regional water uh, body that uh, basically procures water from the state of California and then supplies it to different uh, uh, for-profit groups like San Jose Water Company and also to public sector entities. So, so that is uh, you know where we are looking with uh, respect to some of the water challenges we have. So. The, the project that we have had with the Anderson R R Reservoir, that's been long pending. We recently invested a lot into a water purification plant. And there was some talk about desalinization when we hit the drought. But desalinization, you know, there's a plant that was put in uh, Santa Barbara that, uh, that uh, sort of, uh, you know, the moment it was rolled out, you know, the drought sort of went away and that, uh, that plant has sort of languished. And, uh, and then the environmental groups are dead against, uh, dead against desalinization because of the residue that, it, residue that it generates. And interestingly with Dr. Ajami, the very first time I met her, well, she may not remember, but we were actually there at a Los Caros gathering where we were talking about how uh, a country like Israel had sort of uh, living in the middle of a desert. They had taken their, uh, they had taken some very proactive approaches with water. For example, what we had learned on that day, and uh, Dr. Jami was uh, one of the panelists, <clears throat> was uh, that uh, they teach their young students at a very early age, you know, what does it take for them to be, uh, to conserve water? And uh, this is what they have done. So right from kindergarten, you know, our, the students, uh, the young, young, young kids of Israel, they have a different mindset when it comes to water. And plus they have gone about very regimented, you know, they have rolled out different policies, ideas, perspectives, including desalinization. And now they are completely uh, independent. You know, they don't need water from anywhere, any other source. And they have uh, built out a nice system. So unfortunately with America, you know, we, we invested heavily in infrastructure back in the 1960s or so, I would say. And uh, at this point, we, we don't. And uh, we, we really don't have a plan in terms of California the, the Delta project uh, that uh, Governor Brown had uh, formulated, you know, I'm not sure if it's getting a lot of support. There are certain, uh, certain controversies that have been generated with that project. You know, does it really meet the needs of Silicon Valley? I'm not too sure of that. And uh, so, you know, I think that is sort of like an overall context to what we have. But also when you look at uh, uh, the, the other big challenge that I've been personally dealing with is with respect to to San Jose Water Company and how their, pro their rates have gone up over the last uh, couple of decades. And uh, are, uh, in, in, in fact, even their infrastructure is apparently uh, deteriorating over time like everything does. And their profits went up from $22 million to $52 million in a drought. And then when people had conserved, they did not hit their minimum threshold with respect to the revenue threshold. And uh, there was already a filing with CPUC that allowed them to increase the water rates based on that. So it was a double whammy. We had surcharges, and then because we conserved water, you know, our water bill went up. So those are those are the type of water challenges that we have been dealing with, and uh, so that brings us to Dr. Ajami, and uh, it's great to have uh, uh, someone uh, with the uh, skills and uh, and uh, the subject matter expertise as uh, Dr. Ajami. She is a, a hydro hydrologist specializing in sustainable water resources management and water policy. She is currently the director of urban water policy with Stanford University's Water in the West and uh, the NSF uh, Renewit uh, in initiatives. And uh, she's got an, um, you know, she's uh, obviously got a PhD in civil and environmental engineering from UC Irvine. She's got a master's in hydrology and water resources from University of Arizona. And she's got a bachelor's in civil and environmental engineering from Tehran Polytechnic. So Dr. Ajami, welcome, welcome. It's great to have you. Thank you how for you having doing? me. Thank Good. you. How are you? Thank you, Rishi. All right. Thank, thank you all for joining in. We, we a few, see a few folks who have joined in. And uh, we've we got quite a few RSVPs. We'll see uh, slowly and gradually we'll have a few more folks joining in. So let's get the conversation started. And uh, we, we, we're talking about some of these areas. And we'll start peeling the onion just a little bit more in terms of what these issues are and get the expertise, the expert viewpoint of Dr. Ajami. 
So when you look at, uh, you know, let's start talking about the drought. You know, we had a long period of drought and uh, apparently every 10 to 15 years, we have uh, droughts that emerge in California. You know, when you look at uh, how we are situated, uh, we get rainfall, which is actually not a whole lot. You know, what qualifies a desert is a region that is 200 millimeters of rain or 7.9 inches. And when you look at Santa Clara County, we get like 2.78 inches. So we are conserving water, but uh, even at the low end, the 2.69 million residents of Silicon Valley need over 200 million ga ga gallons of water a day. And there are a lot more other people on the other side of the Bay Area who'd like to take showers and wash clothes and drink water too. And our population is growing as we speak. Uh, so, so how do we address that when you look at uh, what happened with the long period of drought in the mid 2010s and then in 2017, we had, uh, and then later we had a hundred year flood in San Jose with the Coyote Creek flooding and forcing 14,000 people to evacuate. So, so this is a little bit of a dichotomy, Dr. Ajami, you know, when you look at a drought and then a flood, but uh, what, what do you, how do you see this, you know, uh, climate change related probably, but what do we need to do to address these types of challenges to build out a sustainable Silicon Valley, you know, let's talk a little bit about that. Sure. So, uh, you know, as you pointed out, our uh, water system is was built a while ago, and it sort of um, had the underpinning assumption that we'll have the same kind of weather patterns, and we have will have the same kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, population and. Um, and well, we can meet everybody's needs and also the assumption of abundance. We always assume there's enough water out there that we can bring it to, to the people. Unfortunately, um, we are experiencing a very different uh, weather patterns and climatic change. Uh, and uh, we'll see a lot more, we, we have experienced a lot more extreme uh, natural events, including, uh, as you mentioned, the uh, extreme uh, drought that we had a few years ago and also the some of the flooding that we have been experiencing in the region and it sort of has uh, thrown away the um, the existing underpinning assumptions that we had when we built this infrastructure and um, so uh, one one other point I wanted to make is even if we don't talk about climate change as you actually pointed out pretty nicely uh, if you look at California's just recent history in the past 50 years, uh, you'll see we have experienced more dry, uh, abnormally dry and uh, drought years versus wet years. So experiencing dry years is more of a normal and a norm for the Bay Area rather than the, or for California as a whole, rather than um, a sort of like an exception. So we have to actually, um, I would, I would, uh, I believe that we have to manage our water system, assuming that as a norm rather than, uh, and trying to actually be more mindful and more strategic when we have wet years to make sure we save water and we store water as much as we can and actually we protect our water sources uh, in order to meet our future needs. Absolutely. You know, these, these are good choices we need to make. So let's talk about climate change. You know, how is it affecting our water supply how is it impacting us and what do we need to do long-term to address that? Sure. So um, the assumption that we had when we build our infra infrastructure and during the period we build our infrastructure, um, the idea was the, it would snow and rain. Uh, some of the, uh, we will use our mountains as a natural reservoir that would hold that snow for us for a period of time. And these reservoirs that we built would gather up the, uh, the rainfall uh, that we would capture at, at the time and provide water to our communities. And then um, as the spring sort of rolls, rolls in, some of that snow would melt and we'll get more, uh, you know, we fill up the reservoirs and we meet the demands of the communities downstream. Unfortunately, as, I, as you just mentioned, all, climate change has definitely impacted that system, uh, that pattern. You're not getting as much snow as we used to. Uh, the, and the, the timing has definitely changed as well. Uh, we are getting more rain and we are also getting um, uh, the rain uh, later in the season as well. So these infrastructure that we built and all the rules that we put in place to manage the infrastructure, it basically is um, not working the way we wanted it or we imagined it to work. So it's basically, I would say, it's changing the timing and the pattern that we receive, uh, we, um, we get the precipitation. 
and the type of precipitation that we get. Yep, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so Dr. Jami, how is there any specific uh, you know, best practices that we can incorporate in Silicon Valley that you are not seeing today? And specifically, you know, when you look at uh, you know, projects that have succeeded, and I referenced uh, Israel as part of that, you know, what can we do? For example, you know, we rely, rely upon the Sierra Ranges for our, uh, for our water and that is not a very consistent pattern. So what kind of intelligence can we apply to our needs of water? Because uh, when you look at Silicon Valley, you know, we are the 19th largest economy in the world. And the story that I did not talk about was the fact that in the last, uh, so let, let's, let's lay out those numbers. Back in 2016, I think we lost, uh, we were, um, uh, 2016, yes. Yeah. So 2016, we were getting about a net uh, 24,000 people coming into the Bay Area net. Mm -hmm. And 2017, we started losing at the rate of 2,400 people a year, you know, a net 2,400. So it was a drastic swing. And then in 2018, we lost a total of 3,000 people a year, a net to 3,000. So it seems like our population is shrinking. And that's very uh, alarming to me because uh, you know, when I talk to some of my friends who run companies, uh, CEOs, CTOs of different organizations, they tell me that Rishi has become harder and harder to find people. So the younger engineers, the younger population, you know, the moment they start about, think about raising a family, they all leave. So there is a gap. And when we look at many communities, um, you know, for example, closer to us in Silicon Valley, around Stanford, the population is fair is a, is an aging population because the younger folks cannot afford the house anymore, and they end up leaving for Austin or Seattle. So that's that's been a big challenge, you know, in terms of what's going on. So we have to come up with a plan, and we currently don't have a plan in terms of how we're going to address the needs of water. So what should be done, Dr. Jami? I would say actually a couple couple of things I want to touch uh, on. One you mentioned Israel, that's which is, uh, and you mentioned education and. Uh, knowledge that is sort of uh, instilled in their community from very young age. I think if you just go around and ask people, do you know where your water is coming from? 80% or 90% of people are going to say, uh, from my faucet. And then if you ask them, where does it go after you use it? Down the drain. And it's very difficult for them to really articulate where their water is coming from and where it's going. And then you're so disconnected from your source and the systems and the infrastructure and the needs that needs uh, go and the services that goes into providing this resource to you and then taking it out. It's very difficult to engage people in the process of, uh, you know, saving water, being more mindful of the way that we use water, uh, thinking about, you know, paying for water, a lot of different piece that, pieces that goes into it. I think you mentioned about San Jose water and, uh, you know, I've, uh, I'm not, uh, closely familiar with their, um, uh, with how many rate uh, changes they have done recently, but it's not a, you know, it's a very interesting example because they're a privately uh, owned or investor owned utility. And we have a, a number of those, um, but you know, majority of our utilities are publicly owned utilities. And, uh, you know, they, um, and while it's, you know, they have changed their rate, even San Jose Water has changed its rate. I, and again, not knowing all the details, if you look at your water bill versus your energy bill versus your cell phone bill, I'm sure your water bill, bill is still, um, you know, probably much more affordable than the other two. Um, and, and partly it's because we have, we have not been very good at sort of, um, always being mindful of how much we charge for our water, how, what does it cost to bring the service to you? For example, another piece I will tell you is that um, we um, uh, often people, like the, what we are paying for overall as customers, we are paying for the services we are receiving. You're not paying for water as a commodity, as a resource, um, which makes it very interesting because it's one of the most valuable resources we need to survive and thrive. Um, but we are not really pricing in the impacts we are having in the way we are using the resource or polluting the resource or the way it's, we are depleting it and different um, situations. So, um, so I guess the most, I would say the most important piece of this process is actually bringing people and community into this equation, engaging them more actively in the process of 
their, 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 how the, the resources are provided to them, how they can use it, how they need to be more mindful of using it and the way we are um, um, uh, and helping them understand what they're paying for. And then the second piece of it is, so that's, that's very, very important. The second piece of it is actually diversifying our water, our water supply portfolio. You actually, you know, if you, if you talk about diversifying your uh, financial portfolio, people are much more familiar with it because we always talk about don't put all your eggs in one basket. You don't invest in one, uh, one thing only. You want to make sure you have a portfolio of investment that is sort of resilient if there is a problem in the system you have other things that you can rely on the same uh, model the same um, practice should apply to our water supply we should we should expand our water supply uh, and make it much more diverse and the diversity can come from uh, being more mindful in the way we use water. So demand management is definitely on top of that, just partly because it's the, one of the cheapest way for the next drop of water we can have. Uh, the second cheapest actually is actually source protection, making sure the water that we have is not polluted. So you talked about availability. I'll say water quality is another side of availability. When we have water that's polluted, it's, it costs a lot of resources and money to uh, to bring it to the level that we can use it. Then comes that, then not in a specific order, depending on what region we live in. Um, we, we can talk about uh, stormwater capture and reuse, reusing wastewater. You mentioned about purification projects that are going on in the Bay Area. Great example, uh, gray water systems. Um, desalination at some point in some regions are definitely very, can, can sort of make it dent in the process. And also, storage projects actually uh, taking uh, the storm and rain that during the um, extreme rainy season and restoring them in our groundwater then we can use them later so there are there are a portfolio of options that's available to us and we should be very um, we should use them all as a strategic way of making ourselves water resilient dr ajami uh, one quick question for you um this is uh, my name is ramesh kopi i'm a resident of Saratoga. Can you, can local homes also store water? Um, you know, because I've, I've seen some projects like that, that individuals are doing, um, where there's storm water that you can store in the side of your house. Yeah, you can have a, a rain, um, uh, uh, sort of a store, rain storage uh, um, unit that you can put in your backyard and gather rain and then use it during for your outdoor water use obviously you should be you should be mindful of how you're using that water that water should only go for uh, for use for purposes that are you know obviously not for drinking eating or showering but you know um, majority of the water that we use doesn't require very high quality water outdoor water use especially toilet you know flushing and some of those purposes, absolutely. Or just watering the yard. <laughs> yeah, add the water use, that's what I meant. Yeah, yes. water yeah. Use. yeah. Yes. yeah. I also have a, a simple question. Sure. Uh, we live on a property that originally, we, there's an old well on our property. It was the well for this very large estate that's been broken into um, smaller uh, properties. I think, and it's been kind of uh, filled in and everything. Can people put in wells just to use to water their, their, their lawns, for example? Is that something you can do? Because um, we live in a high uh, fire area, yet we aren't watering our lawns because it's, it's just, we can't anymore. I mean, we try to keep some of our plants going, but we've just pretty much letting it go. Sure. Um, so anyway. Um, so, uh, you know, again, depends on the local ordinances and if it's, uh, if it's uh, legal for you to put a well in your backyard. Not every, not every uh, city allows that. But I think the sh generally speaking, what happens is in the household level, if you actually dig a well, you reach a shallow groundwater and that shallow groundwater can be used for different purposes. I would say, um, as you mentioned, um, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of this, this double-sided problem, right? One is uh, you live in a fire-prone um, area, so you want to make sure you have some 
green spaces to protect you from uh, fire and then you have also you don't want to have uh, unsustainable green spaces either right that you end up using a lot of uh, water to protect to maintain it so um, you know some of the th trees that we can use in these areas are very useful and you know you have you, there are actually a list of uh, native species that can be used in the uh, for the Bay Area. Each region has its own native species, and I would say relying on those can be very, very useful and beneficial um, for yours, you know, for your house. That that was a great response and very good questions, Dr. Gopi and Glenda. Thank you so much for joining and asking your questions. Let's keep the interactive dialogue going. So. Anytime, in fact, uh, Gabrielle, if you would like to chime in with some questions, feel free. And I, I just wanted to like uh, put a response to both the questions. So here is, I actually posted this on the chat window. So it's a value water link. The first one is uh, residential, all the different links you need. So click on these links, you will find some great information. And this is, a, Valley Water is our county water agency. So in other words, they are like the, the government organization. And uh, so a government organization is not in the business of making a profit, right? So essentially, yes. in fact, we don't even deal with them directly. You know, we actually, we only like our, for example, the city of Saratoga, our residents only deal with the water company, which is happens to be San Jose Water Company. Where does San Jose Water Company get the water from? They get it from the Valley Water, right? So essentially they have to, uh, they get a bill from Valley Water and they basically pay that bill to Valley Water to provide us water. You know, I mean, so they say essentially procure water from Valley Water, San Jose Water Company, and they sell water to us, right? So that's the system. And then where does Valley Water get the water from? They get it from the state. So they actually get a bill from the state of California and they have to actually pay the state of California. So they look at, you know, their, uh, their income and revenue and all that kind of stuff. And that's how the water rates are structured, you know, year to year. So, but I didn't want to talk about, you know, in terms of policies, the county basically has the jurisdiction over us and they are the ones imposing a water policies on us. Not so much San Jose Water Company because it's a, it's a for-profit business un entity. And so the policies that are coming from for us is coming from the Santa Clara Valley Water District or rather it's, it got renamed to Valley Water now. So it's valleywater.org, I believe is a website. And so if you click on those URL, you will also, you have the ability, each of you have the ability to invite a staffer from uh, Valley Water. They will send somebody out at your home to basically inspect and make recommendations, right? So you have to fill out the WaterWise Outdoor Survey and on, you can also email waterwise at valleywater.org or you can call 408-630-2000. Now also, you know, talk about rainwater. You can definitely put it to good use and I, so there are lots of rebates. In fact, if you would like to purchase rain bar barrel systems, rain gardens, they're all in scope and you might be able to get a rebate. Now you have to check and make sure that sometimes the rebates run out. But if you go to the Valley Water site that I link I provided, it's valleywater.org slash saving uh, hyphen water slash landscaping. So if you go to these two websites, uh, just click on that, you know, so if you are here, and the reason I tell the URL is for folks who are tuning in, uh, they'll be watching the video. Some of them are watching on Facebook as well. And we'll get some questions from uh, Facebook and different other sources. So we'll have a pretty good inter interactive discussion. But let's go on to you know, the next topic, unless uh, we have Gabrielle. Do you have a question, Gabrielle, you would like to ask? No, I don't have any questions. Uh, part of my point of listening in and joining the discussion is I have a design firm based out of Silicon Valley, and it's not unusual for us to do gray water uh, as, as part of the yard maintenance. Uh, larger homes are in Atherton or Woodside. And, and just keeping up to hear what you have to say and what you're following on these, because it's very important. Yes, these gray water projects have been super critical, and we used to talk a lot more about this in 2016 and 2017. Mm -hmm. And then we had one good season of rain, and all that talk sort of went away. You know, I mean, this is you know, people in Silicon Valley are very, very busy. You know, they are productive, they are working pretty hard and they focus on very specific things. You know, and they fo if it in a drought, then they will focus on water. Otherwise they are focusing on lots of other things, right? Right now we are all sort of hunkered down and focused upon Zoom, you know, that's, that's all we are doing. <laughs> so let's go to the next uh, thing. Let's, let's keep this conversation going. So, you know, we touched upon this, right? We talked about uh, private entities and public sector entities, for example, 
you know, in Santa Clara County, there are two cities that are uh, that uh, have a public sector utility company, and that's the city of Palo Alto and the city of Santa Clara. So the city of Palo Alto gets water from uh, from uh, uh, you know the, the city of Palo Alto manages the utility company, and same thing with Santa Clara. But then when you look at San Jose, uh, parts of San Jose, and uh, I would say a good 80% of San Jose, and then you have Saratoga, Las Caras, Montesino, Campbell. You know, we get it from a private utility company, which is uh, which is the San Jose Water Company. So water is a very complex challenge, and I, I'm pretty sure all of you have seen documentaries on this in terms of what happened historically with California water. It's a it's a very very complicated challenge that we have on hand, and to some extent, you know, there has been greed sort of has played out with water in terms of how who owns water and how that came together. It's a very complicated story that you may enjoy watching if you haven't already, but. Uh, what are your views, Dr. Ajami, on the business models and how well they are serving the needs of the people? I think business model is a great question. Uh, I think I sort of was uh, alluding to this earlier, which is sort of uh, the way these systems are set up are very top down. Um, so somebody, um, you know, acquired the water, uh, somebody built the infrastructure, uh, and someone brings it to you but public is not necessarily that engaged in the process. So they just pay, pay their bill and they just, they're done uh, with using the resource. And I think um, that is a problematic, uh, partly because when it comes to changing rates or charging people for what, what it takes to bring the water to them. And actually you've mentioned this whole people saving water, but at the end and the, the rates stop, start going up. Um, it's sort of like, you know, the problem is there's a fixed cost associated with maintaining your water system. So for example, if you have a house, uh, just to give you a, a simple example, um, you know, you have to uh, pay your mortgage, maintain your um, uh, house in so many different ways, right? Um, doesn't matter if you are traveling all the time or you live in that house, you still need to pay some of those fixed costs anyway. Right. So very similar to the water companies, you know, they have pipes and pumps and dams and all sort of infrastructure and actually a team and staff group that's working day in and day out to maintain these systems that regardless of how much water you're using, they need to be paid and maintained. And that's 70 percent of their costs. And then the rest of it is if you actually the amount of water you're using um, which, you know, requires different amount of energy or different amount of, um, um, uh, you know, material to clean it up and bring it to you. And that part is not, is not a fixed cost. It's more of a variable cost. So when you are not using water as much, it, that 70% doesn't go away. There's still need to be maintained, paid for, um, provided for what you are saving is that part of that 30 percent however when you get your bill your you are billed on how much water you're using right so when you're using less you expect to be charged less but the reality is if they charge you much less than what they do what how, based on how much water you have saved some of that 70 percent cost will not be recovered right so that's a challenge with business model, uh, one of the challenges with the business model, which means that we have to sort of change the mindset. We have to make sure that the fixed cost can be recovered and then people can save and encourage to, be, to save to, um, uh, to reduce their water use um, and be rewarded for that based on those variable costs that they there is. So that's another piece of it. And then again, as I said, it's more of a, diversification, that's really, really important. So that business model, again, um, rely on one source is not good. We have to be more mindful of how we are using water um, and uh, expanding that process. Yep, okay. very nice. So it's it's uh, definitely complicated. Uh, you know, I, I think- what Very I was, complicated. <laughs> that, that's pretty loud and clear in terms of how we are situated. And I, I think uh, I would highly recommend uh, all of you, you know, I mean, uh, uh, if you are interested to dig a little bit deeper, you'll be amazed at the, the historical challenge with water that we have had in California. And uh, for example, okay, let's talk about that almond farming, you know, just go and uh, look up how the almond farming happened 
right here in an area which doesn't get a lot of water and how they have access because the almond farming needs a lot of water. We all know about that. And uh, so, you know, I, I, I don't want to, you know, get into that because that could be another topic of discussion for an hour, but uh, it's definitely worthwhile for, uh, for us to investigate into that. So, would, uh, if you don't mind, I'll just say something uh, related to almond farming, which I think it's important to sort of touch on. Um, you know, almonds or other orchards are permanent crops, and that is the problem. We, we used to actually grow, um, grow crops that you could actually, for during dry years or droughts, you could pull them out and basically, um, uh, you know, uh, not, or fallow your land and not grow anything. And then that way you would save water or you would, um, you would sort of, um, survive that drought period. But when you have an almond tree or other orchard trees uh, or other orchards, um, you need to have a certain amount of water to maintain them. And there's no way of saying, okay, because it's a drought, I'm going to let them dry. And then I'm going to regrow these almond trees again, because it requires a lot of investment to, um, to plant those trees and maintain them. So it's sort of that difference is really, really important. So we have shifted from sort of non-permanent crop to permanent crops that actually puts a big demand on our water supply. Correct. And that's a, that's a really good point, Dr. Ajami. And, uh, you know, I think uh, almond is definitely, it's, it's a huge uh, industry that is very profit oriented and it does very well. And, uh, you know, obviously California almonds are supplied all over the world and a big, huge percentage of uh, almonds across the world come from California. And, uh, but, but, uh, you know, if you look at investors, you'll be surprised because there are people who live here in Silicon Valley that are invest investors in the mm -hmm. almond farming community because it's a source of huge profit, but it's so dependent on water. And, uh, and then in a drought, that becomes a big challenge because in Silicon Valley, you know, our water bills were super high, but uh, somehow, you know, it doesn't get evenly distributed across these different industries which sort of creates a uh, little angst with people, you know. So let's go and talk about uh, the water infrastructure right here in California. Does it need repair, you know, and what do we need to happen from a regional perspective, Dr. Jami, for us to get through these types of challenges? Yeah, so um, infrastructure is a big discussion. I think, you know, we, we have built a lot of these infrastructure many, many years ago. They're all man-made uh, systems which means that they have a design life. Uh, you know, you can drive your car just for so many years after a while it's gonna break down, right? So, um, so these, a lot of these infrastructure is sort of surviving on a borrowed time. They actually, the cost of their maintenance and um, uh, operation of them is very, very high. And uh, you mentioned Anderson's Dam, which is a great example of that. And actually dams right now in Michigan, and I'm sure some of you have been following the news, those dams that broke, uh, you know, they, they all were old and, uh, and, um, and had, uh, uh, you know, they were very much uh, required a lot of upper maintenance, which um, sometimes is so costly that it's very difficult to do. So, um, so the same problem applies to us. We, we depend on that very complex, complex infrastructure system that uh, we are sort of operating and maintaining it, but in some senses, they are really um, need to be revisited. One thing I would say is, um, I would say every opportunity, you, um, okay. So I always tell people, if, if your car is reaching the end of its life and you have a chance to go buy a car, do you go buy the same car and the same model from the same year? Or do you buy something that's brand new just because it's much more efficient, it's designed for today, it includes a lot more of our learning over the years, right? Of how, what's more comfortable, what drives better, what feels better, right? And when we are talking about infrastructure and replacing infrastructure, I think the same mindset needs to apply to that. Do we need to rethink the way we do infrastructure or do we want the same kind of old model that we had and, and hope for the best? And, um, so, um, so I, I always try to encourage people to think about this because when we are deciding about what we want to invest in, what kind of infrastructure model we need, we have to think about this and we have to consider, do we really 
um, do we really need to build another major dam or can we actually create a different model? For example, can we build, um, you know, can we be more mindful of how much water we use? Can we uh, uh, clean up some of the groundwater, pollute the groundwater that we have uh, to use it more? Can we do more recycling and reuse? And obviously none of these single sources are going to solve all our water problems but at least they take the pressure off our, our existing infrastructure system. And we are all going to depend on these centralized infrastructure system we already have for a long time, just because, um, you know, a lot of the population that we have depends on those infrastructure model and the, uh, especially the coastal U coastal California uh, sort of was built and grew over time depending on that infrastructure. We naturally didn't have as much water in our region to be able to maintain such a population. So that kind of infrastructure will stay, but we have to try to take pressure off of it and, and manage it more effectively and manage it for the conditions we are experiencing right now. Absolutely, yeah, I think- I, I, I do have a question. Who pays for imp new, new innovative infrastructure? Who own, I mean, if we aren't using a, a public uh, service, um, who would pay for all of that? And is the current utility system actually looking at that and starting to make changes or are they just kind of keeping things going and repairing things? So it depends on a utility you're working with, but generally speaking, um, we, the, we, you and I, through our bills are supposed to pay for some of these infrastructure and also you know water utilities pass bonds you know uh, general obligation bonds or revenue bonds to build infrastructure or they also get grants and some money from federal or state government to build those infrastructure but having said that somebody has to pay for those bonds and uh, you know uh, 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 you know, anything that we borrow, except for the grants, if we bought, get a loan, we have to pay back those, that money and that cost. So, um, but some of our rates um, ideally should go, actually, uh, we, my team and I have been proposing this, a lot of these ideas that we actually, a lot of these water agencies should have uh, a safety net or some, some sort of like innovation budget that actually enable, enables them to provide uh, to invest in innovation and re um, replacing their infrastructure and becoming, bringing them up to date. But um, you might remember earlier I said, our rates are quite, often do not capture all the cost of the service we are provided to. So, in, so there's a, not a lot of money left to even invest in infrastructure on top of that. So it is a challenge. So, so, you know, I think, Linda, you know, my, my take is uh, America is the only country that can keep uh, printing currency. And, uh, you know, there, there are issues with inflation or hyperinflation and things like that. What are we doing right now? You know, we are printing a lot of currency and uh, $3 trillion of stimulus uh, package funding, $2.3 trillion, you know. So this is how we are sort of trying to keep the economy back on track. And uh, to some extent, you know, I think we need to turn the economics in, into a science in terms of how we run the economy of our country, not based on expertise, but actually relying upon uh, a lot of uh, uh, the economic indicators that are sort of turned into uh, a model modeling. So different types of modeling software that can sort of help us guide us. And, and in, especially in crisis like this, because my take Linda is this is the time to invest this is the time to invest and we have to invest and look at defining a future for the next 50 years of America, which we haven't quite done that, you know. We are spending like trillions and till trillions of dollars right now to help people in the country with small businesses and whatever else that's happening, right? Why not look at different infrastructure projects as well and figure out uh, public-private participation? You know, you look at uh, the, the launch yesterday, right, with Elon Musk, you know, that was a great example of public-private participation. You know, a lot of pr private capital that was invested into this. And uh, look at what happened. You know, I mean, it's, uh, it's an amazing story that played out, which is, which is uh, a marvel of American innovation. But also, it's an example of uh, how, you know, American can dominate uh, with uh, absolutely anything we like. 
So, so my take on this is with the, when you look at infrastructure, we talk about spreading the housing out to 21 counties of California, spreading the housing out so that we don't create congestion here, but also building out a high-speed transportation grid, tunnel-based system. Perhaps it's just uh, tunnel-based. Uh, you know, when you talk about Elon Musk's uh, uh, boring uh, machine that he has, you know, each tunnel per mile, the mi per mile cost of a tunnel is actually like one to 10% per mile of a bullet train. So it's much cheaper. And if we connected a city like Stockton to San Jose and we bring down the commute to like uh, 40 minutes versus the two hours minimum it takes, you know, that, that's a pretty a, an astonishing accomplishment. And where do the dollars come from? You know, I think we need to invest in these types of projects. What about the public sector uh, teaming up with the private sector? What happens if Google's, you know, I mean, they are flush with cash, Google, LinkedIn of the world's, they have to build housing on campus to help their employees, provide them housing, but also help fund the infrastructure projects. And this is where the money comes into play, you know. And, and, and we need to do a lot more of these types of projects to make it viable for the future of America because our infrastructure investment has sort of fallen off over the last few years and we haven't quite done enough. You look at the freeway system that we build, you look at the railroad transportation, you know, I think we haven't quite uh, been innovating in that area. So that is something very important to me personally, and I would love to see happen. So, you know, let's, let's now go down to the level of families. And you know, we were talking about the whole picture of water and the drought and the infrastructure, but let's talk about uh, specific families and individuals. And the questions that came up from Glenda and from uh, Dr. Gopi uh, sort of are a good indicator of what we need to do. But Dr. Ajami, would you like to talk about, you know, what, what you know, we as citizens need to do to make this, uh, to alleviate this problem we have today? Sure. So um, let me give you an example. So in, on average in America, we use about 150 gallon per person per day. Uh, this number, if you go to Denmark, if you go to um, uh, Germany, if you go to um, European countries, actually it's like um, almost one fourth, one third of this. Um, partly it's because density, we have bigger houses, larger outdoor spaces. Also the reality is we are, you know, we want to live in the West, but assuming we are living in a wet region, we want the uh, British style uh, grass uh, spaces, uh, you know, green spaces. While we have, we don't even have the weather or the capacity to have that, something like that. You know, I, I, you might not believe, but um, the biggest crop we're going, growing in the U.S. is grass. And that is the grass in my backyard and your backyard and everybody else's backyard. No one eats that. Yeah, not your backyard, but generally speaking. Um, you know, we, um, we don't eat the grass. We don't use, like, it's, there's no real need to grow this crop, but we are, in, we are using a lot of our resource uh, to grow it. So, you know, I guess, you know, it always comes down to how much less we can use in our houses, how much more mindful we can be about the amount of water we use. Um, I would say in a personal level, it's, um, you know, I know a lot of people talk about diet, diets are important. I think we should definitely be mindful of how much, uh, um, uh, you know, water intensive food we eat. But I also say how much, um, uh, you know, everything that we use touches water from the clothes we wear, from the furniture we use, everything that we have uses a lot of water before it makes it to us. So the more we can maintain, uh, uh, take care of our things, buy things that are, you know, can last longer, um, you know, creating the circular economy is, it will be much, we will be, we will be helping our planet a lot more than the way we are doing right now which is a very sort of uh, buy, use, throw away, buy, use, throw away, one directional. Um, you know, when we were talking, Rishi, when you, and I, you asked me about the business model, I think another thing I should have mentioned in the business model, which comes back to this, is, you know, we have this like top-down business model also from the way we, we use the source, we, uh, we take it, we use it, we uh, um, discard it, that while we can actually create more circular systems. But you know, we have this water agencies and then we have wastewater agencies and then we have stormwater agencies. And these are all independent uh, actors in the process that they don't necessarily talk to each other. So this circularity 
also applies when we are talking about managing our system and changing the business model. It's like creating that circularity sort of uh, in the process. And I also, you mentioned about the um, eco uh, economics of all this thing. I think this whole recycling and this um, a sort of circular economy has a lot of um, economic values as well, because it just, in the long run, it benefits everyone. The reality is we don't have a lot of water. Water is a limited resource. There's not unlimited amount of water out there for us to go and bring more. We can't build, we have already tried that. We can't build pipelines and bring water from far distances because it may work for a while and then stops working. So we have to be more uh, mindful of how we can stretch our drops to last longer, to stay cleaner, and we can use it as many times as we can. So it comes out down to the household level, you know, replacing obviously, uh, I'm, I'm showing everybody's, everybody's household in this um, uh, group, uh, this is true, but you know, having efficient appliances, having efficient fixtures, um, you know, having, uh, using, uh, as I said, less water outdoors, these are all very, very important actions that we all can take as an individual. Yep, that was a great answer to a question and you really laid it out very well, which uh, brings me to the next question. You know, when you look at a growing problem in Silicon Valley, you know, we talk about uh, the tra traffic, we talk about the water challenge, but as part of this is also the homelessness challenge and, and many communities don't want to talk about it. And, uh, you know, I, I get emails that, hey, you know, I see that, uh, you know, there's a person who's homeless and can we please help him? And mostly it's about uh, taking this person and putting the person somewhere else. You know, people mm. don't want the person to be there uh, close to them. And uh, even though it's sort of not quite uh, called it out in that way, but I can sense that. And uh, so it's, it's been a big challenge for us in terms of how we deal with the growing homelessness. And if we have gone to the city in San Francisco, we see that type of challenge, which has just exploded over the last few years. How does it impact water, uh, Dr. Jami, when you, when you observe that? You know, what kind of uh, uh, pressure is it creating upon all of us? Um, I'm sure it's a, uh, this question comes um, as a surprise to a lot of people, partly because people don't think homelessness and water have any connections, but the reality is they actually have a direct connection. We have a problem with uh, sanitation that uh, is not provided to these homeless people. And often that, that impacts our water bodies, our creeks, our um, rivers, our uh, lakes. And then on top of that, the amount of trash generated by the, the homeless community that again ends up our water systems is, is uh, significant. And is, so it sort of directly puts homelessness in the heart of water quality uh, management and then eventually water uh, availability. Um, and also, you know, the impact it's having on aqua aquatic systems is also significant, which we all, again, it's a cycle, right? We all depend on. Um, so um, it is a big challenge and it ne really needs to be addressed. And, um, and um, uh, I know uh, in the Bay Area, especially because of the increased cost of living and, and also a lot of other problems, uh, we are having a significant, and we have seen an increased number of homeless, uh, com you know, homelessness in the Bay Area, and uh, definitely um, from the water quality perspective, we really hope that this can be solved in order to we can maintain our systems and water bodies actually from Person. being polluted. Yep, absolutely. Uh, let's see, are there any other questions that folks have? Uh, before we start uh, wrapping this up, uh, it's been a good conversation. We are almost uh, at 3 p.m. Uh, the only question I had, uh, Rishi, and by the way, great uh, idea on organizing this, and thank you, Dr. Jami. It's been super helpful. Um, is, there, is, is desalination also within the plans for uh, increasing the water supply to California? So uh, yes and no. I, I'll tell you for parts of California, desalination is definitely a great idea, partly because they're not, in, they're not connected to the centralized water supply systems we have. For example, Central Coast, uh, when you talk about Monterey, Carmel, those areas, they don't, they're not connected to the Sierra Nevada 
mountains or any of the major infrastructure we have. So they are actually, they have um, maintained and grew within their own uh, the water regional water availability and as they're sort of hitting that limit um, there have been a lot of conversation around doing more desalination however i would say you have to remember desalination has a significant environmental footprint it costs a lot of money and often doesn't even provide that much water like you know israel was a great example that came up you know what's the population of israel it's about eight to ten million people okay uh, Australia has a lot of water, has a, has a few uh, of these desalination plants, especially on the, um, on the uh, east, western coast of Australia. And I think their population is about 12 million. So these, if you're talking about California with 40 million going 50, and then uh, you have uh, you know, these countries that have a smaller population, therefore your, your you know, desalination can be a bigger part of that pie. In California, the, you know, you can build desalination plants from the northern coast to the southern coast. You still are not going to have enough water to give to provide to people. The second well, thing I would say about desalination, just a quick thing, is it costs a lot of money, and we have so much cheaper water, including conservation, including uh, protection of the water supplies, like from degradation and pollution, that you know makes it sort of not economically. Um, you know, valuable um, resource to tap into. But I think at some point, potentially, yes. Oh, great. I mean, yeah, I didn't realize what the, I didn't realize what the scale and the relative size of the water pool is that's available for desalination. But it sounds like it's really not, it, it couldn't, it would probably not be sufficient for the entire population of California. No, it's, it's not as, look, there's no silver bullet. I mean, I guess that's what I have been trying to say from the beginning. I think uh, everything is on the table. Every solution should be evaluated and considered. And I think as a smart, if we were running this as a business, and I know this, is, this has become a very negative uh, uh, analogy to run a country as a business or a region as a business, but you, know, you have to think about it as an economic um, a proposal. Um, you know, you always pick the cheapest option before you go to the most expensive one, right? And I think for water, we should do the same thing. We should rank these solutions and see which one of them. And the cost should not just be about now. It should also be about future, right? When we build these dams, at the time, they were very cost effective, right? But as they age, they're not as cost effective anymore, right? So it's kind of like a long-term cost of economics of these systems are also very important. So... Yeah, great points. So, Glenda? I was just going to ask you, Rishi, if you can make sure you put in the chat or send an email with that link to the history of water. Yes, I'm sure. finding this all fascinating. I hadn't really spent a lot of time thinking about it, but um, I'm really glad I joined. I'm going to have to go do a little study in here. <laughs> um, it's a very fascinating documentary. And in fact, uh, the National Geographic or something, you know, they were offering it an online streaming and had broadcast this to, to everybody in Silicon Valley who I could about that uh, screening many years ago. Actually, it was right in the peak of the mm -hmm. drought. And that's why the water was so very interesting to people. But I'll definitely send all, everyone who's joined here today a link into that. Yeah, I, I definitely would like to look at that. Um, yeah, we've we definitely have are doing things at the house uh, to try to save water. There are times I'm more, I do more things than other times, um, but uh, probably not doing enough. Just remember every time you're flushing your toilet, you're flushing a drinkable high quality water that goes down the drain, which is- Do not tell anyone, but we don't flush every time. That's one of the changes <laughs> we made. I mean, I've, I mean, we how ridiculous when we're taking is that? a shower, we right. catch all the water as right. it and warms then you put up. it in your tub. Yep. And a we lot use of it for other we use it to water the plants. I mean, there are a lot of things that we do. Absolutely. I do have one quick question. If everybody had rain barrels and caught hundreds of gallons of rain I know to, to water the lawns with, would that in any way impact the water level? the underground water level or anything would that have any impact at all like 
if we all caught hundreds of gallons? I, mean, I would say, first of all, um, the water, the rain barrels are a great idea and we should all try to do that. Yeah, we're going to do that. The amount of rain that you capture might not be as much as you think. So it might actually be very useful for a period of time. You still cannot use it for the whole entirety of the time you need to maintain your backyard. I think lawns should not be part of the question. And then the, the, mm -hmm. another piece of it is, yes, it can. And one thing I would say is, uh, we, and we didn't uh, get to touch on this, is we have built these cities and communities, especially in the central, like a major de uh, high density cities, uh, building a lot of concrete and hardscape that does not let the water to seep in and maintain our groundwater level and stay clean, actually, to be honest with you. So um, um, yes, it's important to try to uh, recharge the groundwater and keep the water in the natural system. Um, so, yes. So, so that g gave me the opportunity, you know, while the two of you were talking, I just did a quick search and it is called Water and Power, a California Heist. And it's directed by Emmy Award winner, Marina Zinovich. And I think the last link that I sent you, there are a few YouTube links. The last link I sent you, you could play that and watch that. Uh, it's a very, very fascinating story and eye-popping. It's, uh, it's completely eye-popping. So, so with that, you know, thank you, Dr. Ajami. You know, I think it was a, it's a tremendously learning experience for me. And, uh, and uh, what, what emerged was the fact that we do have a very complex challenge on our hands. And uh, also what we are hearing is that uh, Conservation is a lot cheaper than, uh, than generation, you know. So for us to create new water or even power, electricity, it's a lot cheaper for us to conserve. And that should be what we should, uh, that's our first call to action. You know, we have to conserve water. And if we have a green lawn, perhaps we need to look at not necessarily AstroTurf because, you know, it's not very climate conducive with the heat it generates, but look at natural vegetation. I'll give you a true story. Like when I moved here, you know, uh, I was in love with the green lawns and uh, I saw one of our neighbors and uh, she happens to be a ma master gardener that I did not know of back then. And so her project took her like at least a year. It seemed like a very, very long time. And uh, it was like, uh, you know, different types of vegetation. And I couldn't quite tell why that was been placed on the front yard. Uh, actually, it was on the side yard, but it was, you know, the front yard for us because it's a corner lot. And now when I see it, it's pretty amazing because, you know, she has put like native plants, native vegetation, you know, the flowers are pretty amazing. The birds that come are pretty amazing. And, and it's like, I have found a newfound respect for doing what is natural to, to, to our vegetation, natural to California. And I think we all need to adopt that, you know, we need to apply these best practices. And to some extent, I think what needs to happen is that it behooves uh, publicly, uh, public elected leaders to basically provide access to their information. You know, I think Valley Water is doing that, but we need to make it a lot more easier, you know, providing rebates and all that kind of stuff makes it a lot easier as well. But there's a lot more that we can do. And then also the cultural shift, you know, just like me, I was resistant about uh, a green lawn or not giving up that green lawn on my front yard. Similarly, you know, I think a lot of folks are, are sort of in that cultural mindset where they feel that this is what I should be doing. But, you know, when you look at the COVID-19 world, you know, a lot of these mindsets are going to be shattered and we'll be dealing with a new reality and we'll have to transform and, and react to the new world. And similarly, with water, I think we need to reconcile that it's going to be a new world and we need to come up with best practices that will work well, specific to Silicon Valley. I think that's very important. Investments need to happen. And I think it behooves everybody and anybody who is a publicly elected leader to come out with an action plan in terms of what needs to be done, because we need to plan for the next 25 years, even the next 50 years. And we need to come up with a plan now, otherwise, you know, things will derail for Silicon Valley. And, uh, and then when you look at, uh, you know, the, what uh, Dr. Jami said, the biggest crop that we grow is not the almond farming, it's actually the grass. And, uh, you know, <laughs> that's America's crop. And we spend so much water on that, you know, I think perhaps on the East Coast, they get a lot more water all through the year but uh, a grass may not belong here in California. So those were the type of learning that we had. Thank you, Dr. Jami, obviously the expert when it relates to water. And it was great to talk to you, uh, Dr. Jami. Thank you so much for taking the time on a Sunday afternoon. 
and we'll post this video and it'll get a lot more uh, views of this uh, very interesting dialogue. And thank you everybody for joining in and spending time with us. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Bye. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you everybody. Bye. Bye. I, I did want to say one thing. I think we should make this part of, um, you know, like post-primary school learning. Like high schoolers should learn more about why it's important to go into this field and maybe, they, you know, I'm sure they would get inspired by leaders like Dr. Ajami. And, and thank, what you. You're doing. thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank Bye, everyone. Everybody. Thank you again. Bye. Bye. Thank you.